Thank you, Felix. I also wanted to thank uh, uh, Jim and Charlotte and Michael and uh, Julie and Melissa and everybody else at ACCU who who helped with all my initial travel arrangements to get to ACCU last year and uh, helped get me all set up for this year. So, and I want to say good morning to all the attendees. I'm in California right now, and it is uh, 8.30 in the morning. So I've been around all week. I gave a workshop at the at the start of the week, and I've been attending sessions all week, uh, which has been very early in the morning for me, and have very much enjoyed the conference. So I hope everybody here has enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, so Felix gave me a very nice introduction. Uh, I'm a senior principal scientist uh, these days working on, on Photoshop. As Felix mentioned, I worked on Photoshop Mobile. I've had a fairly fortunate career. I've been at Adobe uh, for over 25 years, although I did take a break in the middle and went to Google for about a year. Uh, uh, and before that, I was at Apple. Uh, so I've, I've worked in Silicon Valley and worked in the industry. And uh, I've, I've had the pleasure to work with some really great people and some really great teams. Um, all of my talks have a goal, at least all of my talks in my, my Better Code series of talks have a goal. And this is kind of the last talk in that series. Uh, I'm hoping to eventually get a, a book published. Felix has been helping me with some of the writing. So the goal for this talk on relationships is no contradictions. So that's just something to keep keep in, in your mind. I want to start with this quote. At least I think this is a quote. Uh, uh, it's a, a, a regarding chess. A novice sees only the chessmen, an amateur sees the board, and a master sees the game. Uh, I thought this was a quote from um, uh, searching for Barbie, for Bobby Fisher, the movie. Uh, but the internet seems to, to disagree. So if anybody can, can actually find where this quote comes from, I would be interested. Otherwise, I think I'm going to lay claim to it myself. Uh, but what this quote is talking about uh, uh, by saying sees is certainly not looking at the board or looking at the game or watching. Uh, 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 but it's that a player of chess sees the relationships. And when you start learning chess as a novice, you just see the pieces and how the pieces move. And as an amateur, you start to see the structure of the board. And as a master, you start to see the relationships that play out in an entire game. Which brings me to my quote, this one I do claim credit to. Computer scientists are very bad at relationships. I think my wife would probably agree with this quote as well. So let's start learning a little bit about relationships and understanding what the pieces are. So relationships in math, a relation is a set of ordered pairs mapping entities from a domain to a range. It's a little different than a function in that the first entity does not uniquely determine the second. So in this sense, uh, relationships go both directions. A relationship is the way two entities are connected so as an example, um, let's see, I've probably got some, some better examples now. Well, give an example there. As an example uh, uh, is marriage, right? right? Two people can be involved, involved in a marriage. That would be a one-to-one -one relationship, but a relationship could also be a many-to-one relationship. Uh, you are a member of your family, and in that way, you're related to everybody in your family, and everybody in your family is related to you. So for any relationship, there's also a corresponding predicate. A predicate is a relation. The, the, the predicate uh, implies a course, I'm sorry, a relation implies a corresponding predicate that tests if the pair exists in the relationship. So if it's true, the relationship is satisfied or holds. So for example, for the relationship John is married to Jane, we have the predicate, is John married to Jane? Now constraints, 
are a little bit of a specialized relationship. A constraint is a relationship which must be satisfied for another relationship to be satisfied. So, for example, the denominator must not be zero for the result of a divisor to be defined. A constraint is a form of an implication relationship. A implies B. This is actually the most common relationship you'll find. And this is the truth table for that. So, if... if uh, Uh, yes, if, if, if A is true and B is true, then the relationship is true. Now, I'm also going to introduce a notion here. This is an incomplete notation for describing relationships. It has a lot of limitations, and it breaks down for very complex structures, but it's a nice way to think, uh, think through relationships. Uh, relationship... Uh, uh, the entities in a relationship are represented by rectangles and the relationship itself by a circle, and this forms a bipartite graph. So where entities are connected to under other entities via a relationship. So implication is represented with directional edges. So this is a shorthand for given entities B and C. A is an entity such that the relationship holds. So you can read this as B and C imply A. Uh, this is also the notation that you would use for a function. So if you replace the relationship with a function, then you would say B and C are the arguments to function to the function, and A is the result. As soon as we have two entities, we have an implicit relationship. Right? A memory space is an entity. And so when an object is copied or moved, or right, so a, a memory space is an entity. So if we have an object in that memory space, then that object is in a relationship with the, with the memory space. When an object is copied or moved, any relationship that object was involved in is either maintained or severed, meaning it would no longer hold with respect to the destination object. When an object is destructed in a relationship, that object was involved in is severed. Witnessed relationships is when we create an object to represent the relationship. So a witnessed relationship is a relationship represented by an object. As an object, a witnessed relationship is copyable and equality comparable. When an object is copied or moved, any witness relationship that object was involved in is either maintained, severed, or invalidated. Right? So an example here that you guys might be familiar with would be uh, 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 iterators into a vector. If the vector resizes, that, that's going to end up moving the underlying contents of the vector someplace else, and that would invalidate our iterators. When an object is destructed, any witnessed relationship that object was involved in is either severed or invalidated. Now, we may choose not to implement copy or move for a witnessed relationship uh, uh, because of the side effect of the, the relationship being invalidated if we copy or move something within it. This is how we get iterator validity. Uh, uh, in, invalidation at a distance, right? right? Without modifying the iterator itself, just modifying what the iterator points to, it invalidates the iterator without actually changing the iterator. So that's a lot of terminology, but that's just to introduce the pieces of this game. So now let's talk a little bit about the board. The board in this game are structures. Right. A structure on a set consists of additional entities that in some manner relate to the set, endowing the collection with significance or meaning. That's the definition of what a structure is. So let's look at a very simple structure. This is a void slide. It represents nothing, not even space. Right? There's no space, there's no time, there's nothing in this slide. And into this slide, we're going to put some bits. 
Now, these bits might represent four bananas, right? Or they might represent the color blue, or they might represent just the abstract number four. Okay. So that's what's known as a representational relationship. Now, the space in which these bits occupy might be able to represent, say, a number in the range of negative eight to seven. We might have then two objects that both could represent numbers in the range of negative eight to seven, and we would say that these two objects then have the same type. Now those two objects themselves could have a relationship with each other, such as four is greater than three. They also have a relationship because they both have a representation. So the hash of one value in this case, uh, R4, does not equal the hash of three. That's another relationship. Now in the real world, our objects don't exist in a void. They exist inside of a memory space. Okay. There are other bits in this memory space which may or may not represent objects. Now, because they exist in a memory space, our objects have a location, right? And in this case, our first object is before the after, before the second object within that memory space. Now I can sort my objects, which is taking the relationship between the values and representing that by their location within the address space. I can also define other operations on these objects, which yield additional values, which can be constructed within my address space. Now let's talk a little bit about safety. So an object instance without meaning, right, that doesn't represent anything at a given point in time is invalid. Think of an invalid iterator. Right? An object in an invalid state must either be restored to a valid state or destroyed at some point in your application. You don't want objects in an invalid state to escape throughout your system. If you start performing other operations on invalid objects, you get invalid results, and eventually uh, your application is just emitting uh, no output whatsoever or bad output. So this is related to the idea of a partially formed object. If you've ever read Alec Stepanoff and Paul McJones' books, Elements of Programming, they define this as a partially formed object. An operation which leaves an object in an invalid state, we call an unsafe operation. STD move in this sense is an unsafe operation. By unsafe, I don't mean bad. Okay. I don't mean that it's somehow evil, but if, say, I stood move a string from one place to another, the string that was moved from is in an unspecified state, meaning it no longer represents any object or any entity. Now, C++ 20 introduce two new features specifically about relationships. At least when I started working on these slides, that was the case. Uh, the first one is concepts, and the second one was going to be contracts. So I lied. C++ 20 introduced one new feature specifically about relationships, concepts. The idea of concepts uh, came out of this paper this is where the term concepts was coined. Uh, uh, and it has its roots in Hoare logic, which was developed by Tony Hoare. So this paper's title is Fundamentals of Generic Programming. It was written by James Dennert and Alex Stepanoff. And here's how 
they introduce concepts. We call the set of axioms satisfied by a data type and a set of operations on it a concept. This is where the idea comes from. This paper by C, by Tony Hoare, an axiomatic basis for computer programming. So let's take a look at what a concept is. We'll start with equality. Two objects are equal if and only if their values correspond to the same entity. From this definition, we can der derive the following properties. We have reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. Axioms follow from the definition. A, connect a collection of connected axioms form an algebraic structure. Connected type requirements form a concept. So let's take a look at copy. Properties of copy and assignment. So the notation here, if we say B is copied into A, that implies A is equal to B, or copies have to be equal. If uh, A is equal to B and both are equal to C, and D is not equal to A, then copying D into A implies that A does not equal B and B is still equal to C. So put another way, copies have to be logically disjoint. If you notice, in order to define copy, we have to pull in a quality. Copy is connected to a quality. Now, natural to total order is another relationship. The natural total order is a total order that respects the other fund fundamental operations of the type. A total order has the following properties. It obeys the trichotomy law, which means that either something is less than uh, uh, another object, that object is less than the first object, or the two are equal. It also obeys the transitivity law meaning that if A is less than B and B is less than C, then that implies that A is less than C. Here, example with our integers, less than is consistent with addition. So for all A's, for all integer value A's, in, um, uh, N is less than N plus one. Concepts are quantified axioms, or quantified axioms are generally not actionable. So a quantified axiom is uh, 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 for all A, or for all elements in a set. So how do we represent those within a language? Well, within C++20, what we do is we associate the semantics with the name of an operation. Right? Software is defined on algebraic structures. That's what software fundamentally is. Now, I think it's important to, def to also understand contracts and how they differ from concepts. Contracts was uh, first coined uh, by Bertrand Meyer in this paper, Applying Design by Contracts. It also has its roots, though, in Hoare logic. From Tony Hoare's paper. That's a picture of Bertrand. Contracts were originally part of the Eiffel programming language, and contracts allow the specification of constraints, uh, preconditions for a function used a require clause, post conditions used an ensure clause, and uh, class invariants could also be specified on a class. Contracts are actionable predicates on values. Now, Bertrand Myers understood the limitations of that. 
And this is a quote from his paper. In some cases, one, one might want to use quantified expressions of the form for all x of type t, px holds, or there exists x of type t such that px holds, where p is a certain Boolean property. Such expressions are not available in Eiffel. Right. So concepts describe relationships between operations on a type, and contracts describe relationships between values. The distinction is not always clear. For example, the comparison operation passed to STD sort must implement a strict weak ordering relation over the values being sorted. Right. So is that a precondition or is that a concept? It falls a bit in between. Maybe it's both. Concepts are used as a compile time constraint to select an operation. Contracts assert at runtime if an operation's preconditions are not met or their postconditions or invariants are violated. A runtime constraint to select an appropriate operation is known as pattern matching. Right? So in C20, we have something like this, uh, where we say that we have uh, a function which takes a variable i, and the double requires clause there allows us to say that this is a valid expression, that not i is. Uh, uh, less than zero. Although that's a valid expression, it doesn't actually compare any values. It's just saying that there must be a less than operator, there must be a not operator on the result of that expression, and that the less than operator has to take i on one side and, is, and a constant zero on the other to be valid. The semantics of that come through in the definition of what less than and not mean. If we had contracts, we could write something like this, that we have a function f that takes an int i, and that we expect that i, that i is not less than zero. In this case, if that were, were violated, the program would assert. Now, one could imagine uh, uh, another form of this, which would be to, to combine the two, where I could say that I had a function f that takes an integer i that required that um, uh, uh, my i is not less than zero. And so if I tried to call this function with a value where i was not less than zero, uh, uh, the function wouldn't be found. And and at runtime, we would look for a function where the requires clause did, did match. So let's talk a little bit about a very important relationship known as the whole part relationship in composite objects. Right, we talked before about uh, uh, the semantics of copy and equality. In a whole part relationship, what we have is a whole object that's composed of parts. And those parts can either be local or they can be remote. So uh, within a whole part relationship, the object is connected. It's non-circular. That's not allowed. It's logically disjoint. So that's not allowed. And it's an owning relationship. So if I copy the object, all of the parts are copied. And if I destroy an object, it just destroys the one object. The standard containers are composite objects. Composite objects allow us to reason about a collection of objects as if it were a single entity. This is why in my data structures talk, I have the goal, no incidental data structures, right? Here is a view class uh, that contains a shared pointer to other view classes, and it's got a weak pointer to its parent, forming a hierarchy. Instead, 
I recommend using a container, something like uh, Adobe Forest, which is a container class within the ASL libraries to represent a hierarchy. And now we can reason about that collection of views as if it were a single object. In uh, my C++ seasoning talk, I introduced the idea of no raw loops. And I gave this example. This was actual code that was taken from uh, the uh, uh, Chromium code base. And it might take you a while to figure out exactly what this piece of code is doing. And if I told you that this was plopped into the middle of a several hundred line function, it would probably take you even more time to make any sense of it. Well, that whole thing is a rotate. So once we recognize that and we write the algorithm as a separate entity, then that means that we can reason about that as a single relationship within our body of code. So now we've looked at, at the pieces and the board. So we understand what relationships are and we understand what structures are. So the next piece is architecture. I don't know how many times I have gone into a meeting where somebody's going to tell me about the architecture of their component, and this is the presentation I get. They say, well, there are these things that my component depends on, and then there's the piece that I'm going to build. And then there's all the stuff that's going to be built on top of me. So this is not architecture. I can draw this diagram about just about anything. I can say to build a house, I'm going to build the foundation. And then I'm going to build the house. And then I'm going to put the roof on it. But the presentation that I would probably get uh, would look more like this. Well, to build a house, we're going to get all the materials. And then we're going to build the house. And then the family is going to live in the house. Right? So this really doesn't tell you much at all about the architecture. Sometimes I'll ask, could you give me some more detail? In which case, I'll get this. Well, yes, for materials, we're going to have some lumber and then some sheetrock and some gravel. And I'll ask, gravel? Well, yes, it's, it's really concrete, but it started out as gravel and everybody just still calls it gravel. And so for the house, we're going to have walls and we're going to have utilities. And by utilities, do you mean you know, power and electrical? They'll say, no, no, no. All the miscellaneous stuff that's not the walls, we're going to throw that into our utility library. That's where that's going to be. And we're going to have carpet. And I'll ask, well, really? You're going to make your own carpet? They'll say, yeah, well, we couldn't find any carpet of the right color. So we're going to make our own carpet. How hard could it be? It's just a lot of fiber glued together. So we think that's going to be pretty easy and not take too much time. And I'll ask, OK, well, what about the family? I'll say, we're going to have two adults living in our house, one child, and an iguana. I'm like, an iguana? That seems unusual. They'll say, yeah, well, our designer has an iguana, so that's the placeholder that we're using for any pet in all of our designs. Right. I'm sure some of you have been through an architecture meeting of this kind. Now, we would like to think that software architecture looks like this, like building architectures, where you have these beautiful diagrams that get developed before you even start building and a complete plan going forward. But in reality, software architecture, whenever I put that up, people say, oh, yes, well, we use UML. Um, 
uh, uh, which is nice. It's, it's at least not a content-free uh, uh, diagram, like a layer cake diagram. Uh, uh, but really, that doesn't tell the whole story either, right? You have some UML, but you also need ER diagrams and flowcharts and dependency graphs and swim lanes and state machines. And there's a lot more information that goes into the architecture. Most software architecture looks more like this, right? And in fact, I think if you walk into uh, uh, a senior architect uh, architect's office of, of somebody who, who works on a big product and ask him how the software in that product works, uh, he's going to go up to the whiteboard with a red marker and draw a diagram that's going to look something like that. In fact, if you walked into my office and asked me how Photoshop worked, I would give you a presentation something like this. I would say, well, let's start with a document. So a Photoshop document, you think about it as an image, but an image is composed of multiple layers. And those layers are composed of multiple channels. And well, we break those channels up into a whole bunch of tiles. Now, between the layers, those tiles don't necessarily align because we want you to be able to, to drag a layer, layer around without having to move all the memory. Now, for each one of, of those uh, channels, we build a MIP map, which is a downsampled pyramid of all of those so that we can render at various resolutions very quickly. Oh, and by the way, all of those tiles are managed by a copy on write mechanism. So every time you do an operation on your document, we're really just tearing an entire copy of the document and just modifying the, 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 the tiles um, uh, that you actually changed. Now, all of those tiles, those are fed into our uh, compositing engine, and the compositing engine is a hierarchical graph uh, where it's compositing everything from in the layers below it uh, with the next layer up, and so on and so forth. Now, it's not quite so unbalanced as you would think here because any particular layer can be part of a layer group, so it can have its own tree hanging off of it. Oh, and by the way, these layers aren't necessarily just a tile layer of pixels, but they could be fed from a generator. So we can generate pixels from text or from vector artwork or from, from a, a smart filter. Now, as part of the compositing engine, uh, uh, that data is also fed through an effects pipeline. And so that's this operation where we take a tiny slice of, of the image, also known as a tile, but this is a different tile. It's much smaller, it tends to fit in L1 cache, and we feed it through a pipeline of small kernels that can perform various operations like blurs and offsets and tinting and apply textures. And that's how you get layer effects inside of Photoshop, uh, like blur effects and, and uh, glows and embossing and uh, uh, beveling. Oh. And that whole compositing engine is driven by our display system, at least on mobile. This is what the display system looks like. We're rendering out to two layers. This has nothing to do with the layers within the Photoshop document. One is a background layer, which is fairly low resolution, and that covers the entire image. That way you never see black as you're panning and zooming. And the other is tracking the, the visible area, but it's slightly behind. That whole thing gets, gets uh, driven by our rendering system, which is a state machine, which is dynamically making requests to the compositing engine to render the pixels based on frame rate. And it's written as a state, state machine so that it can be adaptive based on the frame weights it's able to achieve. It can select rendering from different levels of the pyramid to render faster, but it's guaranteed that as this as the uh, requests to render slow down, it will always settle out on a final end state uh, where you're looking at good pixels for the entire image. Oh, so this is what the rendering looks like in a set of swim lanes because the compositor is running on one thread and the display system is running on a different thread. And so that state machine is managing the interaction between those two threads, making requests out to that compositing engine, 
which by the way is written using a forest, which is this data structure that I invented when I realized that my young son, when he was playing with beads and shoestrings, he had one shoestring that had a very tight knot that we couldn't get undone on one end. And I realized that with that shoestring, the only structure that you could make stringing it through the beads, because you could only pass it through the beads one time, uh, was hierarchies. And so it was a structure where it always enforces the constraint that everything you can build with it is a hierarchy. And I mentioned the strings just because, yes, I'm this guy who in his office uh, draws diagrams on his whiteboard that looks something like that. So what is architecture? So architecture is the art and practice of designing and constructing structures. Large structures are built by combining smaller structures, which are built by combining even smaller structures. Before I move on, you, so you can't understand a large system as a whole unless you can understand each piece of it and how those pieces come together. So when I went through the description of Photoshop and how Photoshop works, nobody at this point, I think, can really get their head around how the entire thing works. The only way that you can understand it is by understanding a piece at a time. And so when you're architecting the system, you have to figure out how do you keep decomposing pieces as they become larger and larger pieces into smaller and smaller pieces and uh, uh, building it up one layer at a time. So let's take a look at how we can do that. Of course, I can't take a very large system like Photoshop and demonstrate here how we would decompose Photoshop. So let's take something much smaller and look at how we can decompose it into even something smaller. So here was a task that I was given. Uh, uh, this was an actual thing for, for Photoshop on iPad, which saves automatically. So the task was, we should save the document every five minutes after the application has been idle for at least five seconds. Okay. Let's take this save the document every five minutes piece out for a minute. And let's rephrase this a little bit. After the application has been idle for at least n seconds, we need to do something. The reason why I took out the every five minutes is that's fairly easy to construct. So this was the first pass that I wrote for the code. Okay, I said, okay, we're gonna have a system clock uh, time point that we're going to set the last at the last time point when the application was idle. So, so really what that means is every time we get uh, an event from the user, we're going to update that time point. Okay. And then we're going to need some function call so that we can invoke a method uh, uh, after some duration, right? So we're going to call that invoke after. So we need to be able to execute some function call after some duration. Mac and Windows and Linux all have OS facilities to, to do this. So we'll just call it invoke after. And so here's what we're going to do. After, uh, we're gonna call this, this function after idle, we're gonna give it a task and we're gonna give it the delay for how long after idle we want it to be. So given the delay and the, the current time and the time from when we last saw an event, we can calculate when this thing should happen. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to say, is that win now, right? Is, is, is if uh, zero is less than win, then it would be now, in which case we would execute it. That would be the else clause. Sorry, I went too far back. Okay, uh, uh, but if it's not time yet, 
right? Because if you think our last idle keeps getting updated, uh, then we're going to schedule this with invoke after, and that's a recursive schedule there. You, you can see we're going to schedule after idle again to try again. So otherwise, we'll execute the task, and then we're done. So that's not a huge piece of code, and it's not horribly complex. But here is how I tend to look at a piece of code like this. What's the structure of it? Let's ignore the recursion part for now. Okay. Here's what the structure looks like. We've got last idle and now and delay feeding in to an operation. And we've got our task, and that's going to feed in to our, our recursion there. So those are the arguments and the dependencies. So this particular problem is really divisible into two separate problems, right? We have two relationships in one function. So can we split this up? Right? This is that first relationship. It's just a single expression. So we don't think of this as necessarily being its own function, but it really is. If you think about this, it's what exactly is this thing? What this expression is, is it's a clock, like a kitchen clock. You can add time to it, and it ticks down. And if your event happens, it adds more time to it, and it keeps ticking down. But you can't force time to come off of it. Okay. On expiration. So this is the other piece that we have in that little, little function. So now we've got our timer, okay, and our task. And so from our timer, we can calculate the remaining amount of time that we have. That's what it's returning. And we're going to feed that to our scheduler. So that gives this little algorithm. We have on expiration, we get the remaining amount of time from our timer. We check to see if our timer has expired yet. If it has not, then we schedule this function recursively to execute again. Otherwise, we perform the task, and we're done. Okay. And then we want to start this timer. We could just call it directly. But the problem with just calling it directly is that if the timer had already expired, it would execute the task immediately. The problem with doing that is that the execution context matters. Here's what happens in, in real world code. Uh, uh, let's say, for example, I'm constructing a document and I want that document to save every time this timer expires. I'm probably going to set up the timer in the constructor for the document. If the timer is already expired at the time I'm constructing the document, then I'm going to schedule, a, then I'm going to save the document immediately on the same thread that I'm creating the document on that I haven't even finished constructing yet. Right? Now the problem is that that will probably only ever happen rarely. The person who wrote the code, every time they're writing it, they're busy using the application, they just created a new document, so the document opens immediately, and, and the save gets scheduled at some time later, now long after the document's constructed, and everything works fine. But at some point in a real world hand, they select a new document, but the system is busy and behind, or it was scheduled as part of playing a script, and events are queued up. And so the document's in the middle of getting created. The device is idle. It immediately saves. The document's not constructed, and you crash. So we want to make sure that we're always consistent. And if code is execute, 
if, if code is scheduled to execute within a given context, we always schedule it to execute within the given context. So architecture. By looking at the structure of the function, we can design a better function, something that's decomposed. Note that our on expiration, it has no external dependencies. It doesn't depend on chrono. It doesn't depend on std function. It doesn't depend on invoke after or last idle. It's just a little generic algorithm that we can plug into any system and we can reuse it anytime we want it to execute a function on the expiration of something else. So the requirements are the semantics of the operations and the relationships between those arguments. All right. So let's take a look at another example. This is the problem of building a registry. A registry is a container uh, supporting the following operations. In this case, we can add an object and obtain a receipt. Right, use of the receipt uh, to retrieve or remove the object. And we can operate on the objects in the registry. So for example, if you have a slot and signal handler, this would be the, the basic operations that you would have in, in your signal handler. Here's how I see most registries get written. We've got an unordered map. Maybe we've got a fancier hash container than that. Uh, we've got an ID, which is going to be our receipt. Uh, when, we, when, when we put an element into the registry, we get back a receipt. All right, there's putting an element in. Uh, we can er erase an element by just looking it up in the map and erasing it. And we can iterate over all the items in the map. So pretty straightforward, pretty simple. So why did I put this up? Well, I was in Russia actually preparing for this talk. And at the hotel, uh, there was a coat room. There are lots of coat rooms in Russia, I found. Uh, uh, not one that happened to look particularly like this. In this coat room, it was just uh, 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 bars with the coats directly on the bars at the, at the hotel. And I observed a, there's a queue of people walking up, and as each person walks up, uh, they either hand them their jacket and get a receipt, or they hand the coat clerk uh, uh, their receipt, and the coat clerk walks over to this rack and she looks briefly in the middle of all these jackets. She thumbs through a couple of them, pulls out the correct coat and hands it to the customer. Another customer comes up, gives them their coat. She just puts that coat on the end of the rack. And I'm like, well, how does this work? She's always putting the coats on the end and she can always find the correct coat within the rack. Well. This is the Russian coat check algorithm. It's probably the coat check algorithm in every country. Um, I wouldn't know that because I live in California and we don't have coats in California. But here's how this works. It's recognizing that receipts are ordered, right? That there's an underlying relationship going on here. Coats are always appended and you hand out a stub can do a quick binary search to retrieve a coat by matching the receipt to the stub. When more than half of the slots within the coat rack are empty, uh, the person managing the coat rack can just slide all the coats together and compress the rack and have more space on the end to put more coats. Coats are always ordered by the receipt stubs. So as an additional useful property, coats are always ordered by insertion. All right, so let's build one of these. So to do that, we're just gonna use a vector. And our vector here is going to use a size T, that's going to be our receipt in our stub, and an optional T for, for placing our jacket. Oops, hit the wrong key. So to put 
a, uh, a jacket in, we're just going to append it on the end. So we can put in a bunch of jackets like that. And you notice we're not putting in just the jackets, but we're also putting in the stubs. To erase a given jacket, we can do a binary search. That's what lower bound is. Uh, just comparing uh, the first element, which is our stub. So that's our comparison operator there. And if we didn't find the jacket, we can tell the customer no jacket and just return. Uh, otherwise, it's an optional, so we just go ahead and we delete the jacket. Remember, we're just erasing here. We're not returning it to the customer, but you could return it if you wanted to. And then uh, oh, we also decrement our internal size count there. So now if we've erased more than half the jackets, okay, then we go ahead and we remove them from the vector and we erase the empty slots in the vector. So how does that work? As customers come up, they get their coats, Okay, eventually more coats are gone than half. And so we make a pass and we delete all the empty slots and compress our vector. Now notice our vector is still ordered, right? So it continues to work doing a binary search to look up new elements. Now we can go and add some more jackets and so on. And we can iterate this registry just by looping through the vector. Very simple. So how does this perform? So, so this is a, 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 a looking at, at inserts and erase over the entire, entire container, um, uh, or how fast it is to, to iterate with for each. So there's a difference of 640 between those two bars. Now, what I didn't tell you in this graph is how many times I was doing it, right? You would think that that would make a difference. It turns out it really doesn't. Okay. If I have uh, 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 Elements, this is what the, the graph looks like based off number of elements and the number of allocations. Okay, That's the time difference right there. And that time difference grows linear out to about 2 to the 20 elements. So the relationship here, understanding that the receipts are always getting handed out in order can be exploited for performance. Understanding the relationship between the cost of operations is important. Understanding that a heap allocation for an element is much more expensive than the amortized constant time of putting items into a vector. And now that brings us to uh, uh, back to our goal, right? Remember, we had this goal, no contradictions. What does that mean? Well, if I were in an audience, I would ask people to raise their hands. You don't have to, though. Uh, how many people know what double entry bookkeeping is? You can just answer to yourselves. Double entry bookkeeping is an accounting tool for error detection and fraud prevention. It relies on something known as the accounting equation, which is assets equals liability plus equity, which is an example of equational reasoning. It was pioneered in the 11th century by the Jewish banking community, likely developed independently in Korea in about the same time period. And in the 14th century, double entry bookkeeping was adopted by the Medici Bank, which is a name you might have heard of. In fact, double entry bookkeeping is credited with establishing the Medici Bank as reliable and trustworthy, leading to the rise of one of the most powerful family dynasties in history.
double entry bookkeeping was codified by Luca Pacioli. He's the father of accounting, and it was codified in 1494. That's a picture of Luca Pacioli. Uh, the other individual standing behind him is known as the perpetual student. Uh, nobody's quite sure who he was, uh, uh, but he may have, may have been a friend of the, the artist, another artist, Gerard. So, double entry bookkeeping. How does it work? Every transaction is entered twice into at least two separate accounts. There are five standard accounts, assets, capital, liabilities, revenues, and expenses. This, this ensures the mechanical process of entering a transaction is done in two distinct ways. Right? Every transaction is entered into two accounts, but there's not just two accounts, there's five accounts. So for any you know, pair of transactions, they might span two different accounts. If the accounting equation is not satisfied, then we have a contradiction. So what's a contradiction? Well, that's when two relationships apply, imply the same entity has different values. Relationships are consistent if they imply the same entity has the same value. Right, so if we have two relationships, both implying the same entity, that has to be the same value. So this happens to be the exact same structure that we have for a data race. Right. When two or more threads access the same object concurrently and at least one thread is writing, we have a contradiction. We could resolve the race with a mutex. Right? We can put an additional relationship in. So we have now our two relationships write out two separate values. Those get fed into a mutex. The mutex decides which one wins and imposes that as our resulting object. But what does that relationship mean? Right? It's a last one in wins relationship, which is kind of an odd relationship, and it's certainly a very difficult relationship to reason about. So when I point out a data race in a code review, and the engineer says, oh, well, that's easy, and they throw in a mutex, this is usually my expression. Is this, does this fix the problem? Does it not fix the problem? I don't know, right? What's the actual relationship between those two values? Which is a goal from one of my other talks, no raw synchronization primitives. That also first appeared in my C++ seasoning talk. Right? Null pointer dereferences are another example of a contradiction. Right? If I do p equals member, I get a sigabort if p was null. Right? Why? Well, I've got this underlying rule that says I can't dereference a null pointer. If I dereference a null pointer, I've got a contradiction and I get undefined behavior. Right. How can I fix that? Well, I could check to see if the pointer is null or not before I dereference it. Right? I can say if p, then p member. The graceful handling of nothing as a limit is important. Right? We have empty ranges, such as zero, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but frequently, you know, removing sections of code to avoid a crash is likely only moving the contradiction someplace else. And I'll give answers like this. Just saying that if P don't do the thing, Right? You just removed conditionally a section of code, and you didn't really think through what is the underlying relationship. So a pro tip, use strong preconditions to move the issue up to the caller. Right? If you can resolve these issues at a higher level, you're probably doing a better job than trying to make the decision at a lower level. So transform a function that's taking a pointer and then dereferencing the pointer if you can 
into a function that takes a reference. And now it becomes the caller's job to make sure they're handing you a valid reference. Two functions setting the same value through a shared pointer, that can also be a contradiction. Right? I can set the property someplace else, I call pset property. What does that even mean? Maybe the code's redundant. Maybe I should only be setting it from one place and not the other. Uh, uh, maybe what there really is is a single relationship, and this is different flows through that one relationship, right? Remember, relationships are bidirectional. So maybe uh, uh, I go one way when I'm calculating A times B, and A is changed, and I'm following the other path to represent the relationship A times B when B is changed. Uh, maybe they're mutually exclusive, and uh, it's a mutually exclusive relationship with non-local control. Right? Maybe it really does imply last one in wins relationship. Connecting two shared pointers like this create an incidental algorithm. Right? Or Maybe this is an inc incidental algorithm where the pro property is going to be changing over time from different places in the code and it's going to converge to a correct value. Right. The property here is not a simple property. Maybe the property is not a simple property. Maybe it's a stream, a trigger, or a latch of some kind. Or maybe it's just wrong. Right. So when I see shared pointers in a code review, that's my expression. No raw pointers. Consider the essential relationships. This is what you need to learn to play the game. Learn to see the structure in your code. Take it apart. Draw it out on a whiteboard. Learn to, re to decompose it and recompose it. Architect your code. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, if you'd like to see more of my talks, they can be found uh, on my website, which is uh, seanparent.stlab.cc. And there's a link at the top for papers and presentations. I also want to point out Photoshop is hiring. I think we have eight open positions right now. And in fact, there may be an open position uh, to be working directly with me. So. Uh, please check out the website, and if one of those positions interests you, uh, submit your resume or your CV. Thank you. And I will open it up to see if there's any questions. Ah, so somebody asked why no raw synchronization primitives, the meaning, right? So uh, first, when I say raw, uh, uh, what I mean is is a relatively primitive construct that just appears, say, within a large, uh, larger function or, or member function, or dropped into the middle of some piece of code. So when I say no raw loops, right, what I mean is don't it's not don't ever write a loop. You write lots of loops, but when you are writing a loop, encapsulate it into a, a separate algorithm. Uh, raw synchronization primitives in this case are um, uh, things like uh, mutexes, uh, semaphores, uh, condition variables, those are very difficult to use correctly and very difficult to get right. Instead, you want uh, uh, higher level primitives, you want continuations, you want uh, uh, communication channels. Uh, 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 you want uh, uh, things that operate at a, at a much higher level than just throwing in mutexes. So similarly, when I say no raw pointers, people frequently interpret that to mean like a T star. Uh, but no, even a shared pointer class is a raw pointer uh, in the sense that I now have pointer semantics that aren't encapsulated behind a class with value semantics. So what I said, uh, somebody posted here, oh, I don't understand how a mutex can't solve a race condition. Oh, a mutex solves a data race condition, but a mutex uh, uh, will equally as likely solve a, um, uh, uh, or create a logical race condition. So if you uh, watch uh, my concurrency talk, I give an example 
of a, a reference counted class and memory leaking uh, because uh, I check the reference count once to see if the if the object is uniquely owned and then if it's not uniquely owned um, uh, 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 I go ahead and I give up the reference um, decrementing it, but I don't check to see if it went to zero because by checking to see if it was uniquely owned, it had to either be one or greater than one. Assuming that it was greater than one uh, 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 or knowing that it was greater than one at one point doesn't tell me on the next line looking at that atomic uh, that now it could be, be one. And so, so you end up, even though you have an atomic, you end up with a logical race. And in that case, the, the problem was leaking memory. Uh, so we said uh, on two occasions, I referred to any senior rec architect as he. Uh, my sincere apologies for that. Uh, I certainly work with uh, some, some wonderful female architects, so. I should say they. It's a new question. Are there any learning materials you would particularly recommend? Uh, you know, um, uh, that's a... Uh, 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 that's... 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 Interesting. Uh, you know, my usual go-to is, is elements of programming. Uh, but it's it's a fairly difficult book to get through. It is now an open source book, so you can just Google for it, and you'll find the website. and And it's it's no longer being published, but you can just download the PDF and and work through that. Uh, uh, so so I think that's a great book if you want to understand kind of at a, a you know less mathematical level the ideas that went into that book. Uh, Alex Stepanov's uh, from uh, Mathematics to Generic Programming is a very good book that's a much easier easier read. So, so that's a good entry point. Uh, but no, I don't have a lot of good, good references to point at. Uh, somebody asked, uh, do I always look at everything from an architecture perspective? Um, I, I do in the sense that I always look at uh, the relationships between uh, the functions and the objects uh, that I'm dealing with and how these systems come together. And when I'm doing code reviews, uh, uh, I've mentioned before, the first thing I do is I scan the code for loops, and I usually start at the loops because that's usually where the problems are. Uh, the second place will be uh, conditionals. And, and uh, uh, those are the places where you're going to end up with... with um, uh, you know, contradictions or, or logic errors, errors of, of some kind. Uh, uh, and, you know, when I'm writing my own code, I'm, I'm always looking at, at can I decompose this into smaller parts to build up the larger parts, and how does this compose to build a larger system? Let's see, other questions that are here. Uh, do they often lead to small refactorings, or do you need to perform potentially large and practical refactorings? Um, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, 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 you do have a need to to approach um, uh, uh, large refactorings to fix a system, and this is one of the the current problems that I find with continuous deployment is it makes it very difficult to step back and do a large overhaul on a significant um, uh, uh, application. And so a lot of times you're left with trying to make compromises and rebuild it small pieces at a time from the inside out. Um, uh, you know, and you got to keep all your, your unit tests running and everything else going, which makes it very difficult to actually uh, 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 create a system where you can capitalize on the new architecture. Um, another approach that you can take is what we did with Photoshop for mobile, which was basically take the entire application as one node in your relationship graph and 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 effectively build a new application on top of it. 
So what I mean by that is the way uh, Photoshop on iPad works is we took all of Photoshop, including all the UI constructs, but we just stripped off the visual aspects of the UI um, and threw that into its own thread. And every place where there was UI, that became uh, a uh, as a collection of observable properties. So those were properties that we could also both connect to and monitor when they changed. And uh, um, uh, and set. And so uh, 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 all what should have been, you know, application and model logic that over 30 years had crept up into that UI layer, we just captured the whole thing in one fell swoop. And then we put a transaction model uh, that has some guarantees around sequential consistency and it's non-blocking uh, between the new UI surface and that asynchronous thread. And we communicate between the two that way. So, so that's how, how that works. Um, let's see. Is there a way to mark these as answered? Yes. Um, how hard do my colleagues find it to pass a code review uh, with me? Um, uh, you know, it depends, honestly, somewhat on how busy I am and how interested it is on the, the, the piece they're working in. I don't have enough time to to look at every piece of code with the with the detail I would I would like. Um, uh, a, a story I had a. Uh, a young, uh, uh, a, a young employee who uh, I was mentoring when he first came on board, and uh, uh, I gave him a task, and he he would write part of it and come to me with a code review, and I would slash it up and uh, give it back to him, and I was being. Um, uh, 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 brutal in the code review, but but also I wanted him to really solve the problem and 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 get to the, the underlying piece. And he got pretty frustrated at one point and walked into my office and said, you know, could you just tell me what the right answer is? He was kind of tired of coming back. And the honest answer is I didn't know what the right answer was. I just knew that his wasn't correct. And and he thought I was was just playing games. But it's much easier to look at something and say, I don't know what this is. I don't know if this is correct. You know, please explain or go fix it. Um, uh, uh, than it is to actually sit down and 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 work through a design on your own. So. So so you know if if I'm in a in a detailed mindset, I can be pretty difficult to get a code review passed. Ah, uh, let's see. Do you think the industry still started with a primitive whole design in their products design, having all these uh, uh, agile and CI/CD practices design? Uh, uh, would it be hard dealing with such design refactoring? Could be handled as a tech debt later on. Yeah, you know, tech debt is it's very hard like I said before, to fix things. And it's very hard to get things right from the start. So you have to kind of keep refactoring bottom up. And so it eventually surface out, surfaces out into your, your top level design. Um, uh, there's only two people that I know of, one person who I know directly and uh, uh, one person just by reputation and by reading their work who I think can look at a large complex system from the top and come up with a, a, a well-constructed detailed design top down. Um, uh, those two people, uh, the first is Mark Hamburg, who I've worked directly with. He was the architect on Photoshop in the early days of Photoshop. And he had this amazing ability to uh, 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 write features top down, filling in blanks for what had to go underneath and getting the underpinnings correct. My first experience with that was when I first joined Adobe. He had uh, 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 written the tiling system and it needed to plug in to uh, a software VM system to feed the tiles asynchronously. And it was 
you know, initially it was just just accessing uh, 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 things synchronously, but the plan was that it would be asynchronously. And in his code from the top down, he had every hook for doing it asynchronously correct and in the right place. So all I had to do was write the underpinnings and the top worked. So that was a pretty amazing experience. Uh, the other person who I would say has this attribute is uh, Ken Thompson. And that's just from reading his work on, on writing early chess programs and uh, System 5 Unix. Um, uh, and the design of, of UTF-8, you know, I don't know for a fact, but I suspect that he has this quality. Uh, you know, those are two people that I would consider kind of grandmaster league, and I, I don't put myself in, a, in either of those leagues, you know, as a, as a chess player and a coder. Um, uh, I still have to fumble around a lot with the pieces and try moves and look at the board and then retract the move and, and try again to get things right. And I think that's where most people are. Uh, but, you know, understanding that your first move isn't the best move, I think, is, is half the battle. Uh, let's see. What else do I have here for questions? Um, You've said before that algorithms should usually not be written by yourself, but used from libraries or taken from standard texts, or if strictly necessary, invented or shared atomically. What advice would you give for finding an implementation of an algorithm when you don't know a standard name for it? Uh, that's always hard. I mean, uh, read lots of uh, 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 lots of papers. And for example, the Russian Kochak algorithm, yeah, probably already does exist, and I'm sure it's probably in the wild. Um, uh, I don't have a solid implementation in a library is a, is a follow-up question. Um, uh, but, you know, I'll look at adding it to, to the STLab libraries. Um, uh, it, it can be a challenge for finding names for things, and it's especially challenging because the industry isn't good about naming things. And so the same algorithm in one language standard library or another language standard library will have a different name. And so really what you have to do is go and, you know, read through the algorithms that you have at your disposal and understand them. Um, I still think that uh, 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 Knuth's book uh, uh, should be, you know, on everybody's shelf as kind of a reference for finding things. And they're well organized. You know, you have an entire volume on sorting and searching algorithms. And, and so that's always a good place to look to see if it's a known algorithm. And usually, if you can at least find an instance of the algorithm in the wild somewhere, uh, then that will give you a name. And from that, you can find other names. And then you can find an, an implementation that, that you can use. Uh, but, um, you know, get, get books. Knuth is a good starting point place. Uh, uh, I'm very enamored with uh, 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 Bob Tarjan, who's a, a Turing Award winner. He has a very small book on, on network data structures and algorithms, um, uh, which just contains some absolutely uh, uh, beautiful data structures and algorithms. It's like a 150-page book or something like that. So just search for uh, uh, Bob Tarjan, and I'm sure you'll find it. I forget the name of the book right now, and I'm not in my office, so I don't have it on my shelf here. Um, so, yeah, it's a hard problem. Uh, Wikipedia can be pretty helpful, too. Uh, any algorithms that I'd like to be added to the C++ standard library? Lots, lots and lots and lots. Um, uh, first, I think the 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 algorithms that you do use every day, kind of the basic algorithms, various forms of for each, find, transform. There's there's you know a couple dozen variants of both of those algorithms in slightly different format. And I would love to just have have you know files that's like here's all the kind of basic find algorithms and 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 all the ways basic ways that you can describe find uh, just because those are so common and and you know a lot of times you go to just say well I just want to find this thing but STD find isn't quite the right fit so we should kind of fill in all of those gaps um, uh, but yeah there's all kinds of you know numeric algorithms we don't have any graphic algorithms and graphic algorithms are applicable even you know for a lot of problems outside of graphics uh, 
you know, things like uh, Bresenham's line algorithm is really uh, a very fast way to to distribute uh, uh, a, a set of elements across a line with as close to even spacing as you can get for for uh, an, an integral unit. Um, so that has lots of applications outside. Uh, some of the algorithms that are in the standard library, like we have power, but we don't have a generic power. So you know, I, I can't take the power of a matrix. So if you wanted to calculate Fibonacci numbers very quickly, it's raising a Fibonacci matrix to a given power. And we don't have a generic power algorithm. We don't have a generic uh, GCD algorithm, although we have a concrete one. Um, uh, so yes, many, many, many algorithms that should be in the standard library. And, and and there's there's lots of tension, you know. The the more stuff you put in the standard library, the more challenge it is for all the vendors to maintain. Uh, but I would like there to be, you know, just a massive collection of thousands and thousands and thousands of algorithms. Uh, has the iPad OS Photoshop stuff been backported to desktop? Uh, uh, would you think that would be valuable? Um, uh, there is a plan to do that. Aspects of what we've done uh, are already in the desktop. It is a shared code base, so both products are built out of the same code base. We're not living on a fork or anything. Um, uh, I don't know that we'll, we'll go all the way there. In fact, I think where we're going to end up is kind of a, a hybrid blend uh, between uh, some of the two architectures. There are some advantages to say how the display system works on desktop that uh, we can't do on mobile. So if you look on um, uh, desktop, if you see transparency areas in Photoshop, they appear as a checkerboard. And that checkerboard is fixed sized regardless of your zoom level. Uh, but if you're on iPad, the checkerboard is actually uh, burned into the pixels. By the way, checkerboard is also drawn with a present hemline algorithm, since I mentioned that a moment ago. Um, uh, 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 and the reason for that is the way we do the display system on mobile, uh, we can't kind of do late compositing. And that has some advantages from for mobile, but it also has some disadvantages, like not being able, able to render transparency. So we're kind of looking at doing a hybrid approach between what the desktop does and what mobile does. Ah, let's see. Yeah, I think I already mentioned I did look at everything from a from an architect, architecture perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look, I will mention when I write code, I tend to write all of my code in a little console app. I have a, a Scratch app um, uh, where I just keep appending code at the top and pound if zeroing all the code out from underneath it as my reference. And then when I get the code working in my Scratch app, then I copy and paste it into a file. And uh, uh, that becomes the component that I integrate into the application. And that means that I'm always looking when I'm writing a component to try to write it with zero dependencies. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't pull in the entire application into my little console app. Uh, there are some libraries that I, I rely on so that I can co compose the pieces, uh, but I don't want, you know, it, it to be a, a, to require a composition of everything. It should just be the pieces that it's using. And so, yes, yeah, so I very much kind of always look at, at how do I decompose a problem. See, somebody's posting links here. Oh, that's everything that uh, uh, Bob Tarjan, his papers, um, probably search for him on uh, uh, Amazon. Let me see if I can find the name of the book real quick. Mm -hmm. 
data structures and network algorithms. And it's probably out of print now, but I will post a link in chat. Didn't realize how valuable my copy was. Um, if you can find your own copy somewhere, maybe it's available online somewhere. That's the book. That's one problem that I find with, uh, you know, I always think that if a book goes out of publication, it should automatically go into the uh, public domain. I'm a, kind of an anti-copyright and patent person. Oh, thank you, Jim, for echoing that. Oh, yeah. Uh, comment on, on, on ADSP, the podcast. Yes, I'm very much enjoying that, even though it's a little, can be a little uh, challenging to hear my name so often brought up on a podcast. So a story I've told before, um, uh, I listen to a CPP cast and I'll usually listen to it, to it in my car. And a while back there was a, a uh, uh, Kate Gregory was the guest on C CPP cast. And, and I got into the, to the car with my wife and I turned on, just started the car and it started CPP cast where I had left off. And uh, Kate and Jason were going back and forth and, and then Kate said, said, she goes, and then I had this Sean parent moment and Jason goes, a Sean parent moment. And Kate goes, goes, yes, this Sean parent moment. And they never explained what they meant by that. And they just went on in the conversation. <laughs> My wife turns to me and she's like, were they talking about you? And I'm like, yes, I, I think they actually were talking about me, but I have no idea what they were talking about. So, so Kate did fill me in later about what they were talking about. Uh, uh, but somewhat humorous to get a mention like that. So I think unless... Uh, Any comments on how the goal of no contradiction relates to the immutability of data structures? Yeah. Um, uh, so certainly, uh, you know... It, Immutability helps, right? Right. The the shared writing of something is um, uh, is one way that you can get a contradiction, and so removing mutability, um, you can both uh, you can remove that contradiction. You can remove the data race contradiction is another one, which requires you know at least one thing writing while you have multiple readers. Um, uh, 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 for you know for any operation, you can kind of you you can demonstrate. Uh, that that either performing it in place, um, well, for any operation, first you can perform it in place, or you can perform it uh, 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 with a copy with with immutability, um, uh, uh, or you can perform it lazily, which means you can construct a construct a function that would yield the result piecemeal. Uh, uh, and that's true for any operation. The difference there is that each of those will have uh, varying complexity, and it's not always it's not always the mutable structures that have the fastest complexity. Sometimes they are not the fastest. Uh, uh, so, you know, in fact, for some operations, even even in the STL, uh, like stable partition, it's called a, a memory dynamic operation, which means it tries to see if there's enough uh, uh, space to allocate spare memory, and if it does, it allocates spare space. And I think most implementations don't even check to see what a reasonable amount of memory would be, so they just always allocate a secondary buffer. Uh, but you know, you can do an in situ part partition, but the fastest way to do an in situ part partition is to. Uh, or, or stable partition is to to copy, you know, all the good guys into a buffer and copy all the bad guys into a buffer and then copy them both back in in place, and so so that's the the you know the fastest implementation it turns out, assuming you have the extra memory. You know, so so that's a trade off that as as engineers you know we have to make we have to figure out. Uh, how important performance is to us, and 
and how do we capitalize that? And I think, you know, most engineers who spend a lot of time in imperative languages like C++, you know, that are as opposed to non, as opposed to functional languages that spend time in, in non-functional languages, I shouldn't have said imperative, in non-functional languages as opposed to functional languages, always think in terms of mutations first. And, and you should try to, uh, uh, try to look at uh, 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 both composition, you know, a lazy algorithm, and look at a functional solution, also, and and determine what the what the weights are. Uh, so, do you want to make an invalid states impossible to represent, and how often is this pr practical? Yeah, ideally, you want to make the invalid states um, impossible to to represent. The problem there is there's a provable trade-off there uh, with performance. Um, uh, 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 in fact, uh, the canonical example is copy or is a sort, but it's it's true of 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 any in situ um, uh, uh, algorithm. And in the case of sort, uh, the fastest way to do sort is to uh, sort in situ, and in the fastest way to do it in situ is something that you can't easily do in C++. Uh, it would require a destructive move, but it's if you think about uh, uh, any permutation, at some point within your sequence, you have to remove an item if you're doing it in place and then fill in the hole, and you keep doing that, uh, removing items and filling in the hole. Well, at the point where you remove the item, ideally, you don't want to write anything back into the hole. You, you just want to leave the hole. That would be called a destructive move. You move the object to another place and leave a hole where it came from. Uh, 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 but that basically means now your your sequence of objects is no longer contiguous, and so it's no longer in, in a valid state. Um, uh, uh, so so there's this, this fundamental trade-off that you have between performance and safety, and so you have to take care. And I think I see a lot of issues getting called caused by two things one is the the uh, uh, you know I already mentioned shared shared pointers uh, but uh, uh, two of the newer things are optional and um, oh, it was the first time I was thinking it, it will come back to me so so let me talk about optional for a minute um, uh, I see people making more and more and more code with optional and letting optionals kind of spread throughout their system and ideally with an optional you kind of want to you know it's a good function result if you have something that can return something or nothing uh, but then the, once you have the optional uh, 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 you want to you know basically take the insides out and go one direction or go a different direction. You don't want to keep carrying the optional around and turn everything into a maybe monad because at some point somebody's going to forget to check and see is the value there or not. And and it's they might as well have just dereferenced a, uh, a null pointer. You know, If they went through the value thing, maybe it throws an exception, but it's equally as bad for the correctness of your application. Um, Uh, oh, the other thing that I was going to mention is uh, 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 explicit move and and R value references. You really want to try to avoid explicit moves, which means you still want to use R value references. R value references without the explicit move are safe, um, uh, but that just means that you have to compose your code in a more functional fashion, so that the function results of one thing become the immediate arguments to the next thing, and you're not putting them into a temporary and then moving them out and causing the problem that now you've got this this uh, 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 you know invalid object in your code, which the next programmer isn't going to realize is invalid, and they're going to use it again on the next line. So, so yes, you want to try to make the impossible states. Uh, uh, the invalid state's impossible to represent, but you can't. And um, uh, this is even true in 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 you know Haskell or purely functional languages, right? If it's Turing complete, you can build a C machine inside of it and always write the same bad code that you could in C. And so, so uh, 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 your language will help, but it won't save you. Uh, let's see. Any other questions?
uh, somebody said variant. Um, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I think uh, 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 variant is one of those things where I don't think it gets used enough in the sense that I think a lot of people reach for polymorphism as a first choice, even when they have a closed set of data types where a variant would be a better solution. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, a variant done well where you're basically packaging uh, things up into, uh, you know, anytime you have polymorphism, really what you want to be doing is packaging things up that have some similar trait, that, that, that they all satisfy the same concept. And so if you have a variant that's a collection of objects that satisfy the same concepts, uh, uh, then that's great. Then it's just another value type and you use it as if it were any of those objects and everything just works. Uh, where you get into trouble with variants is when, when you don't do that and, uh, uh, you know, instead of kind of having a generic visitor that will do the same thing on all the objects, you have special case after special case after special case, those things you want to avoid. Uh, do I have comments on physical layouts of the C++ project? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a case that I'm horrible at. Uh, uh, I would like to see a standardize things uh, 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 more. There's a uh, proposal that people have started following more and more, which is, uh, what is it, the, the bike shed layout, I think is what it's called. Let me see if I can put a link in chat. Shed library layout. Stick a link in chat. Um, uh, this is kind of the best uh, 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 top level layout that I found. We don't do this right now with ST Lab. I'd like to switch ST Lab to do that. Um, uh, I you know, Adobe right now is rolling their own uh, kind of dependency management system that I'm hoping we're going to open source. Uh, you know, when you're building on kind of a bundled product, like a, a desktop product, uh, which is a little different than a server product where you're trying to get, you know, like one application to run inside of a VM. So you suck down all these libraries and, and they're all as DLLs. Basically, we want to statically link everything and to do that well, to do dynamic link, linking well, you want everything built uh, uh, from sources with the same compiler settings, uh, with the same compiler, with the same set of dependencies, and shake things out that way. And there just are not good tools for doing that. Um, uh, so Adobe has been, been rolling their own, and I'm hoping we'll be able to open source it. And I've been pushing on that team. What I would like to say, see happen is if you have a library that follows a standard layout, uh, like a bike shed layout, um, uh, that you should just be able to say, oh, you know, add the dependency to that library and tell a dependency management system nothing more and it will just work. Uh, question here, is our system complementing CMake? Uh, uh, yeah, it's not building another build tool, so it's a complement to, to uh, CMake and JIP and a couple other build systems that, that we, we run internally. Um, so yes, it's a complement to CMake. Its job is just to handle dependencies, like one of the, you know, nice things about CMake is you can kind of uh, uh, insert things like build settings from the top down, but um, uh, uh, there's no way within CMake to express this library requires that it be built with C++14, as an example, you know, at least 14. And if you're, if you want to be building everything with the with the same compiler settings, then that imposes a restriction on every other library that you would want to integrate together. Uh, 